All right, in today's workshop, we're going to cover some information about experimental techniques in photoluminescence, uh, which I think everyone in this room has done or will do these types of experiments, so it could be helpful. Obviously, the most helpful experience is going to come from actually doing it in the lab because all the instrumentation is a little bit different, and there's additional little tricks and things you have to learn by actually doing things, but this will give you an overview of the different types of experiments and some considerations to keep in mind while you're doing them. All right, so the first thing we'll talk about are the different types of samples that you can use for photoluminescence measurements. And our group uses most of these, but obviously some are more common than others. So you can do measurements in solution. That's gonna be the one that you'll most often encounter in, in your research or when you're reading about photoluminescence research. Um, there's also thin film samples that are that are possible, and these can be of sort of two varieties. They can be either neat films, which means just the pure compound deposited as a film, or very often the way that we do it and, and many other groups do it is a dope film where you're gonna have the luminescent compounds gonna be mixed with some sort of inert matrix. You can also do measurements on bulk powders. Uh, so this is gonna be more common in the, in the solid state world, like over in Pergotch's group. But uh, we have done this before in our, in our lab, and it certainly is possible to do on certain samples that, that can be helpful. And then something that's a little bit more rare is um, doing photoluminescence on single crystals. There are actually potential advantages of doing it this way, um, particularly if you have a goniometer that can align the crystal, because we I don't think we really talked about this much in the introductory material, but all of these excited state transitions, in many cases, they're polarized in one or two, more than one direction, but not necessarily isotropic. And by, by doing it on a single crystal, you can get information about the polarization of the state, which can give you some information about what type of excited state it is. So single crystal measurements are pretty cool, but they're just not very common, not very easy to do. All right, so for samples that are done in solution, you're gonna, you're gonna uh, typically house those in a cuvette. You can also use, um, you know, things like NMR or EPR tube as we sometimes do, but cuvettes are the best way to ensure a consistent path length, reproducible uh, measurements and all that stuff. So the most typical cuvette, which is the type that we exclusively use in our lab, are, are one centimeter by one centimeter. That's gonna be the dimensions along the sides of the cuvette. The height is typically all, all pretty much standard and, and they, these would hold roughly 3.5 to 4 milliliters of solution in a standard cuvette. Um, is the path length that's that's most important. Um, these types, these other types of cuvettes are not as common for photoluminescence, but um, you may encounter them sometimes. So there's long path length cuvettes that would be, for example, two centimeters in one direction. Um, these long path length cuvettes are more useful for absorption measurements if it's required that the solution be very dilute, for example, um, in, or, or if it's very weakly absorbing. By increasing the path length, you'll get higher absorbance. And I suppose that could also help in luminescence measurements also if it has a really weak absorption cross-section. You can increase the path length, you'll absorb more of the light, and then by contrast, you'll also emit, emit more of the light. But again, it's just not very common to do this, but it is possible. And then sometimes, especially on really precious samples, like biological samples, where you don't have a lot of material to be able to use a standard cuvette, there are micro cuvettes, which at least in one direction would have the same path length, um, and then they're just sort of shortened. So it's a little bit hard to see what's going on here, but basically this is like a double-walled cuvette. So it's still the same dimensions on the outside, but then it just has a, a little slit in the middle here that you would fill a solution. Our, um, the cuvette that we have for spectroelectric chemistry is kind of like this. So those are different types of standard cuvettes. Now the other variations you have in cuvettes, um, I sh should look at my slide before I tell you so I don't <laughs> start rambling. Um, so again, these are reasons to change the path length. Um, so sometimes also short path length cuvettes are used as well, Not again, not always common in photoluminescence necessarily, but for like a lot of transient absorption measurements, if you want a more concentrated solution for whatever reason, you can, you can do that. Um, now the other things that you have in other variations you have are the different types of caps that are on the cuvette. Um, so this open top here, which if you have an open top cuvette, it usually comes with just like a little Teflon disc that just sits on the top of the cuvette. It doesn't really provide a seal at all. It just sort of physically rests there. Those are 
only going to be good for fluorescent samples. As we talked about before, fluorescence is not typically sensitive to O2. So if you get air in your sample, it's not going to matter if it's fluorescence. Um, and if you, you know, or if you're just doing a measurement where you really don't care about having oxygen, because this is not going to provide any sort of seal. The open top cuvettes are also not particularly good if you have a really volatile solution that can evaporate. Um, these Teflon stoppers are, are fairly common and I've never used them myself. Uh, they're, they're typically, they're not rated as airtight though, so they are liquid tight, so especially if you have a really volatile solution that you want to keep for a long time, these types of stoppers will do pretty well. Um, it's kind of like the stopper that we use in like the separatory funnels, it's just a little Teflon thing that just jams in there. Um, so it works pretty well for keeping things from evaporating, but it's not going to keep air out for very long. So it, it would not be good for that. Now, as we always do in our lab, since we're mostly working with phosphorescent compounds, we have these two types of airtight cuvettes here. Um, so these have pretty decent protection from air for short periods of time. I would, I mean, I, I guess people like Greg would have better insight onto this, but I would say an hour or less is probably the time scale you're thinking about keeping air out for these. I mean, obviously some samples are more sensitive to air than others. You may not notice it always. Some of them um, even five or 10 minutes, but others you can be several hours. Yeah, so these types of screw caps are okay, but not great at keeping air out. Um, the advantage of the septum cap, which we often use, is that you can inject either the sample if you want to do a um, you know, serial dilution, or you can inject other things like air or other reagents if you're doing a quenching experiment, and you want to, especially if you want to vary concentration, you can sort of just do that as you're doing the measurement. I have to always take it back into the glove box to, to refill it. And then the other fancy type that we have talked about in abstract before, I don't know if I've ever showed you the diagram, it's something like this. We had a bunch of these in the group that I did my PhD in. So it's usually a standard coarse cuvette down here. And then um, that'll be sealed off with a Teflon plug. And then that connects via a little sidearm to a, a round glass bulb over here, which has its own then Teflon plug and ground glass joint. And so what you can basically do with this sample is a few things. Um, you can do freeze pump thaw degassing. So you can, if you want to get your sample rigorously air free, especially if you had a high vacuum line to do it, which we don't, you would start with the sample in the bulb, you would do the freeze pump thawing here, and then with this valve closed to keep the air out, and then this valve open, you would just basically physically tip the sample and transfer the liquid from here to the cuvette. Um, it's also good if you want to do, sometimes for really sensitive measurements, you would want to vacuum transfer the solvent. So that's where you, which again, something we don't have the capability to do in our lab, but if you have solvents that are drying over, if you're working with really sensitive samples and you have your solvents drying over like sodium or usually it's like sodium benzophenone mixture and you can just distill the solvent directly into there um, and not have to physically add it. Um, so th these would be valuable. Now one thing I thought about getting, and I guess since we're on the topic we can talk about it now, I don't think we need this whole elaborate setup necessarily, but I was thinking about seeing if the glass blower could custom make some cuvettes that would just be basically um, just this left part here. Let me try to circle that. My mouse is not working so well today. Um, so like basically just make cuvettes that look like this. So they would just have, and that would be, if we were doing stuff that's particularly air sensitive, that would just be a better way of sealing the cuvette than using these screw caps. Um, so I thought about seeing if the glass blower could make these so basically the way they're made is you have you can buy quartz cuvettes that have sort of a graded seal glass tube fused onto them and then he would just need to fuse the teflon joint onto that so it shouldn't be too hard for him although um, those graded seal cuvettes are not cheap so thinking about getting a couple of those that would be again for samples that have really long lifetimes that seem to be particularly sensitive to o2 especially if you're trying to get you know, a quantum yield or something. Um, you can't, obviously with this type of cap, you can't inject aliquots or you can't, you know, easily adjust how much oxygen or air you're letting in there. But if you need a really good seal for something, that would be a better way to do it than with these screw caps, especially if you want to, for some reason, keep the sample for a while or fertilize the sample for a while or something and you want to keep air out. This would be the best way to do it. Yeah, I guess freeze those technically. Not unless you have the glass bulb on there. Okay. 
So you don't, you typically don't want to freeze the cuvettes because um, the way that these cuvettes are made is they have, um, I'm not sure exactly what they use, but they use some sort of glue or sealant to basically just phys physically attach the four walls of the cuvette. So that can easily get messed up if you heat it up. I mean, I've, I've seen people dry cuvettes in an oven like 100 degrees Celsius or less, but freezing them is always a bad idea. And um, so I just remember you, you brought it up before if you could get like I guess EPR tubes that are like physically smaller and we could basically do low temperature, lifetime temperature. Yeah, so for that you would also you would also need a doer that this would fit into. Um, I mean the yeah, the way to do low temperature lifetimes you could probably, I don't know, we'd have to see how, because I think even if you have the EPR doer, it, I think that's too tall to close the... Yeah, so like you need something, at least like a third of the size. I mean, the way that most people do variable temperatures, which I'll show you a little bit later in this talk, is with a cryostat, which you would, in that case, you would usually seal like a little glass ampule or coarse ampule, and then that fits inside the cryostat, which then reaches down into there. But yeah, they, right now we don't have a great setup for low temperature lifetimes, unfortunately. Um, yeah, so that, so then one last consideration for whatever type of cuvette you're using is the type of material that it is. Um, so a lot of people in doing biological research use plastic cuvettes, so anything that's aqueous is, is fine in those. They're not going to have the greatest optical quality, but most of the measurements that people do in a biological context don't require you know, terrific levels of quantification or spectral quality. Um, glass works okay, but it it cuts off you know around 300 nanometers, so you can't you can't really do measurements in the UV or excite in the UV below that. Um, the other problem that glass sometimes has is it it's like the borosilicate glass has um, some like metal based impurities in them, and I don't think they're luminescent, but it is more of a concern that you would have. You know, luminescent impurities in the glass, which of course would provide some background and could cause problems in certain situations. So the best is quartz, is what we have. It's the most versatile. It has a wide transparent window. It goes, you know, below probably down to at least 150 nanometer. I don't know what the what the cutoff is for quartz, but it's really low, below any of our instruments anyway. Um, and it can go all the way out to the near infrared at least. And it has good optical characteristics. So again, ensuring reproducibility of of measurements is is key as well. So those are some things about cuvettes. And then the way that we would deal with either solid samples or films are typically it's gonna involve a stage like this um, that's rotatable. So you'll, you'll be able to change the angle of the sample relative to the excitation beam and, and to the emission detector. Again, that'll make more sense when I show the diagram later. And then some sort of sample holder. So a lot of them come with this type of little, this little sample holder would be used for solids. You would just pack the solid in there is one way to do it. That of course doesn't do a good job of keeping air out. So, um, so if you're dealing with solid samples and films, another way to do it besides using these fancy sample holders is you can just add the solid as a bulk pot or, or deposit as a film in you know, cuvette. It's a little bit harder to do it in a cuvette if you're doing a, th a film, but like in an EPR tube, you could just put a solution in, evaporate the solvent, and that'll give you sort of a deposited film on the side of the EPR tube. So I've done solid measurements that way before. The other way that we've done them in our group, were you involved with this at all, so on? So they, we can sandwich powder samples between two coarse slides, um, and you can even seal them with grease to keep air out, which does an okay job. And then these special solid sample holders and rotatable stages are often included. We have, we have at least the stage, I think the sample holder we have as well. For film samples, most often you just cast them onto a, a microscope slide and then would, you would hold it on this type of thing. We can do spin coating if you need an even film, although for most photoluminescence measurements that doesn't really matter too much. Um, and if you do a neat film, that would be the compound by itself, which I don't think the types of compounds we work with would easily form films, but um, dope films are what we, what we often do where you have the compound in a matrix, usually a transparent polymer. And then once you have the sample, again, usually deposited onto a slide, you would hold it on a sample stage, something like this, that you can then again rotate and make sure it's aligned properly for the measurement. So a lot of those finer details come with experience and trial and error, but that's kind of how it works.
All right, so let's look at a diagram then for how for what a fluorimeter looks like. Um, if any of you guys are are fortunate or unfortunate enough to have Roman on your committee, you need to know this in more detail than I'm showing it here. Because he always asks, "How does the instrument work?" Um, but you should know at least a little bit about it. It is, it is useful to understand how your instrumentation works, not just treat it as a black box. So in a fluorimeter, you have a lamp, and I'll give you some more details about these components on the next slide. So your excitation light is provided by a lamp of some sort. Um, and the reason, if you're wondering why do we turn the fluorimeter on usually, you know, 20 or 30 minutes before we use it, is to let the lamp warm up and stabilize. It's not going to give a stable output at first as it sort of warms up. Um, we do have excitation corrections, so it's probably not a huge deal, but it is still helpful to have a stable lamp output before you start. So the lamp provides white light, and then you'll have your first monochromator will split the excitation light into whatever wavelength you, you call for for your experiment. Um, so again, more details about the monochromator later, but this basically splits your white light continuum into discrete wavelengths, and then you'll select one of those wavelengths for excitation if you're doing a typical emission experiment. And then your sample is here. So the excitation beam goes in one direction, and this isn't the best drawn diagram because it's in two dimensions, but then the emission will be detected 90 degrees to that. So in reality, the way that I've drawn this, the emission will be detected out of the front of the cuvette coming towards you, not downward as I'm showing here in two dimensions. But you're going to have, you're going to detect at a right angle to your excitation. So the emitted light, which again is going to typically be a range of wavelengths as we talked about last week, to, to know which wavelengths you have, that would go through a monochromator, it would be split, and then one wavelength at a time, that light is going to go onto the detector, which is usually a photomultiplier tube. And then so that's going to, that's going to determine the intensity at each wavelength, which is then fed into the computer program to give you the spectrum. So those are the critical components, and obviously there's a lot of, there's probably, you know, there's additional mirrors and optics in there to, to help focus and direct the beams to the right place. I'm not showing all those details. There's electronic components because the, um, you know, motorized components because the monochromators have to move for them to work. You probably hear that sort of whirring noise that whenever you change the wavelength range on your monochromator, that's the monochromator physically moving to then move into the right position to be able to um, you know, to detect and all that stuff. So, so there's a lot more things in here, but these are the essential components. Let's talk a little bit more about them in one at a time. So there's most often, the most common type of lamp is a mercury xenon, which provides intense continuous white light. Um, and then the monochromators, those again are very important both at the excitation side and the detection side. Um, and they're going to be either a prism or a diffraction grating. I think modern instruments all use diffraction gratings now. Prisms are kind of old school. Um, so those are going to be used to separate the light into the constituent wavelengths. So if, you, if you've ever seen or played with a prism, you know how it works, right? You put, you know, if you hold it up to the sun, it, it'll basically produce a rainbow as it splits the, the light into all the different wavelengths. And then um, that's basically what's happening in the monochromator. Um, and so those are going to work via optical dispersion or wavelength dependent diffraction. So then whatever dispersion element you're using, the grating or the prism is going to then be rotated relative to the other components to determine which wavelength actually reaches the exit slice. That's that noise you hear is that grating moves around to be able to direct the correct wavelength out into the exit slit. Um, so then as I said, the detector is going to be 90 degrees relative to the relative to the excitation, I guess, is a better way to say it. So it's going to be on um, one side of the sample and 90 degrees from where the excitation enters the sample. The most common type of detector is a PMT photomultiplier tube, and that's the type that we have on, on Fluoro 1 and Fluoro 2. Um, and there are many different types of PMTs, so they all differ with respect to, you know, the, the sensitivity, how, how much signal they can detect and to the range of wavelengths that they are able to detect. So there's there's a lot of different options. Um, I think the one that we have on Flora 1 is called an R, it's a 928, that's like one of the most common ones that are found in fluorometers. The one we have on Flora 2 is different, which is why it's able to detect a wider range. I forget the numbering system for that, but basically it detects a wider range of wavelengths, and that's why um, we have that. Another type of detector that you'll sometimes see not as common with Fluorometers, although we have something like this on our UV Viz, is a, a CCD or a diode array. Those are two closely related technologies. 
Uh, these allow you to detect all wavelengths simultaneously, so you don't have to, you'll set a monochromator to split the wavelengths, but then you don't have to detect one nanometer at a time. It can just detect the whole continuum that you produce and then read it all out in one shot. So that's why our UVIS is so much faster, because it can do all that in one shot, and I have to separate one, one wavelength at a time. And then for near-infrared detection, so when, when Greg went over to Jim Ming Bao's lab and did detection of singlet oxygen emission at 1200 nanometers, they, they use a semiconductor photodiode as the detector, which is in, the most common one is indium gallium arsenide. So that's what you need to do detection beyond around 1000 nanometers or so is where those would start. These typically also have to be uh, cooled with dry ice or liquid nitrogen because they get a lot of thermal background noise that you have to eliminate or reduce to be able to do measurements. Even some PMTs you can do that on. So the um, the flurometer we had in grad school was well it was unnecessarily huge and complicated, but um, it it was, it was really modular. It had like double it had double monochromators on each side, so it was huge. Um, but in that case, we actually had a sort of a, a dry ice um, bucket that we could use to cool the detector, which was helpful even if you're going out to like you know the 800 900 nanometer range. Although it seems like our instrument does okay without cooling the PMT, and I don't think we can anyway. Um, but for for semiconductor detectors, cooling is typically necessary. And all of this, of course, is controlled by the computer, which um, on modern instruments allows you to control just about all of the instrument settings. Um, the the flimeter I had in grad school, you had to actually manually control the slit width with these little thumb screws. But you know now that's all automated. Um, and the only thing that, as I'll talk about a little bit later, the only thing that we have to do that's manual is just like the filter that we're going to use if we're using a filter. But everything else is controlled through the computer. Um, all right, so then there's a few different experiment types you can do. So again, that instrument that I just described that you would record what are called steady state spectroscopy, do steady state spectroscopy on is called a fluorimeter most commonly. And the most common experiment you do in that is an emission spectrum. So that's where you would you know, use a fixed excitation wavelength, one wavelength going into the sample, and then you would detect whatever light is emitted by the sample. So you're going to get that typical wavelength intensity profile, usually detected one nanometer at a time over whatever range the, the sample emits at. Now the other one that we'll talk about a little bit today is an excitation spectrum. Um, and every time I ask this at group meeting, I feel like I get an unsatisfactory explanation of what an excitation spectrum actually is. So does anybody want to volunteer to explain to the room what an excitation spectrum is? So basically for your excitation spectrum, you choose a wavelength that from your, the emission of your compound, basically the detector is going to hit it with a monochromatic, monochromatic light, observing the wavelength that you have chosen, and basically as the um, intensity of emission, or the intent, so like it's basically going to hit like a range of your sample from usually where your sample absorbs like 200 to 500, 250 to 500 nanometers, it's going to just blast that entire thing with a monochromatic light. And your sample, based on its absorption, has uh, characteristic intensities that should lead to the emission profile dead. So when your absorption is larger, you'll, yeah, when your absorption is larger, that should correspond to your emission peak. And when you don't have anything there, you should get less, less absorption. So basically when those two overlap, it usually means that your photo-excited species is the same thing that's emitting, uh, which are like that somewhat satisfactory. Yeah, the only the only difference I would say is you're not you're not actually using all excitation wavelengths at once. You're still you're still putting in one excitation wavelength at a time. But the difference is, in this experiment, you're just monitoring the emission intensity at a single wavelength. So you're not scanning a range of, of emission wavelengths. But what you're scanning are different excitation wavelengths. So it's almost in some sense a little bit of the opposite of the emission spectrum. So you're seeing how the emission intensity changes as you change the excitation wavelength. So um, so that's the difference, and again, we'll talk about the significance and importance of it later, which Morris got into a little bit, about how it's important that it should ideally match the absorption spectrum and some other things that you can interpret from it. But in terms of how the experiment is carried out, it's still the same instrument. The only difference is, if we go back to the diagram, this might help to look at. So in, a, in an emissions experiment, this monochromator is going to select a single excitation wavelength, 
and then this monochromator is going to move so that you can detect all of the different wavelengths that come off of your sample. In an excitation experiment, this monochromator is going to be fixed to allow you to detect a single wavelength, and this monochromator is going to move during the experiment to allow you to use one excitation wavelength at a time, and you're seeing how does the intensity of the emission change every time you change the emission wavelength, or sorry, the excitation wavelength. So it's one emission wavelength scanning different excitation wavelengths. So it's just really determining instrumentally, it's just determined by which monochromator is actually moving during the experiment versus which one is fixed. Um, and that's all that changes in terms of how the instrument does things. All right, so back to experiment types. Um, now, another important thing, those are the two major ones. I mean, there's some, there's some other things that our instrument can do, but um, these are the two major ones that we actually would report. But what's important to keep in mind when you're measuring an emission spectrum, I think, I think this has been drilled into our group's psyche enough that I don't have to go over it a lot. But you'll see a lot of times in the literature, people will overinterpret observed emission intensity. But observed emission intensity depends on a lot of things. So you know, you're, you're going to read off some intensity measurement from at each wavelength if you're doing an emission spectrum, or you're going to see how that intensity changes if you're doing an excitation spectrum. But that measured intensity, that raw number that you get, depends on a lot of factors. So the first is, you know, so IPL, that's your intensity. So I0 here is the intensity of the excitation light. So depending on what excitation wavelength you're using, the lamp is going to put out a different intensity at that wavelength. So, so that factors in. 5PL is the photoluminescence quantum yield of the sample, which we talked about last time. And then A is the absorbance at the excitation wavelength. Um, and then finally, the last one, which is why it's very difficult and in reality not possible to compare measurements, especially if you're doing two different instruments. If you're trying to compare like your results to someone else from a different part of the world, every instrument is different. So there's this K factor here that's basically instrument specific in terms of what intensity you'll actually measure. So you can control you know, the absorbance of your sample. You can measure the quantum yield as we'll talk about today. I0, you can usually correct for that. Our, our instrument does do what's called excitation correction where it would um, you know, it would correct the response for what your intensity of excitation is. You don't have to really worry about that. But even still, every instrument is different, and even little changes in the alignment of the sample and things like that can affect your observed intensity. So if you're doing like a single quenching experiment where you're, you know, you have one sample in there and you're not changing any of the settings, then sure, comparing emission intensities is, is fine. But if you're measuring two samples on two different days, or if you're changing a bunch of settings, you don't want to read too much into your observed intensity. Um, so it depends on a lot of factors, and so you don't want to try to make those types of comparisons. The best way to do it is always to measure a quantum yield if you're trying to say that one thing is more intense than the other. Now, when you when you collect one of these types of experiment, when you do one of these types of experiments on a fluorometer, there's a bunch of parameters, and you're again familiar with most of all of these because of the work you've done in the lab. So obviously, you, you can select the excitation wavelength, which would be a single value if you're doing an emission experiment, or we select a range that we're going to scan for an excitation spectrum. In terms of the range that's available, that of course depends on the instrumentation that you're using, and you'll probably be able to find that in the, in the owner's manual um, if you're not sure, um, although usually this, a lot of times the software won't let you select an, a wavelength that's outside of the range anyway. But most are calibrated, I think ours is calibrated down to 250, I believe. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't know what the longest wave excitation wavelength we can select is, but it's probably at least 600 nanometers. So I don't know what, what if, if anyone's tried anything longer than that. There's not really a need to with, with most of our compounds, but um, they're usually calibrated at least that range. You can select any excitation wavelength in that range, or if you're doing an excitation spectrum, that would be the maximum wavelength range you could choose. The emission is, again, you, you, you typically would select a range of emission wavelengths to monitor for a single experiment. What range you pick often requires like a little bit of knowledge about where your compound emits, so you might mess it up the first time and have to adjust the range to, to get it just right. Um, and if you're doing an excitation spectrum, again, you're going to pick a single value for the emission wavelength. Most people just do the peak of their sample, whatever, wherever the emission peak is, but it doesn't have to be just anywhere where that compound emits. Um, now, the available range for the emission wavelengths depends on what type of PMT you have, as well as the calibration of the monochromator, and you know, there's also emission corrections and all that stuff. So again, that'll be defined by the specific instrument you're using. Most instruments are, are calibrated in this range, 300 to 850. 
Um, but we can go longer than that on at least in fluoro too. Um, for an emission experiment, what's important is that whatever wavelength you're starting at should be longer than the excitation wavelength. So if you want to start detecting at 300 nanometers, you would need to make sure you're exciting at something below that. You don't want to see your excitation spike right in the middle of your spectrum. That's, a, that's going to be, typically be a lot of light. And then the other important thing to keep in mind is you don't typically want to span a range of wavelengths longer than two times the initial wavelength that you're starting at. So if you're starting at 300, in reality you can't really detect out past 600 nanometers. Sorry? That's just the second. Yeah, so that's because of second order harmonic detection. So when you have a, a monochromator that uses a diffraction grating, um, because of second order effects, in addition to detecting lambda, you're also going to detect two times lambda at any, at any wavelength. So if you have a mission at some wavelength, and you detect out to two times that wavelength, you will also see signal there, which is not real. Um, so if you have to do a sample that you know spans a wider range than that for some reason, your only choice really is to do it in two pieces, and then use filters to make sure you're blocking out you know, the, the light that would emit at the higher energy when you collect the lower energy and, and so on. So um, that's really your only thing. So it avoids these second, and so like, for example, we often start at 400, you can go out to 750 or you can go to 800, but you can't go beyond that or you run the risk of seeing these second order effects. And sometimes it's not easy to tell that you're seeing them either. Um, so you wanna make sure that you, you be careful about that. Um, the other thing that we vary, and, and this is the one thing I said we have to do manual, is, is using a long pass filter. So what you'll, you'll use a filter that, so, what, so, so the way a long pass filter works, do I have anything more on this? Yes, yeah, so let me, so the way a long pass filter works is um, they're rated at a certain wavelength and that's, the, that's gonna be the wavelength where they would have 50% transmittance. So if you look at the transmittance curve for a, for a filter, um, so if this is 50, then it goes zero and 100. If you have a 450 nanometer filter, the transmittance curve looks something like this. So if this is wavelength, let's say 300, 400, 600, so wavelength's increasing left to right, a, a long pass filter is gonna let everything through that's above 450. So it's gonna be 50% at 450. So it'll be kind of this sigmoidal curve sort of thing like that. And that'd be 50% right there at 450. So that's what those would look like. So you would need to select a filter that's rated at a longer wavelength than your excitation beam because the point of the filter is to filter out any stray excitation light. So if you're exciting at 350, you can use, let's say, a 400 nanometer filter. Um, but again, the rating of the filter is where it's 50%. They're usually pretty sharp transmittance curves. So you know you might get some bleeding through on maybe 10 nanometers on either side of that or so, but usually beyond that, you'll, you'll get pretty much you know 0% transmittance below that. 100% transmittance above that, and that's um, that's how those are rated. Um, all right, so then the other thing you control is the slit width. This determines how much light gets into and out of the monochromator. Um, so basically, the, the monochromator has a, it's, I'm not sure exactly mechanically how it works, but it, it basically determines, and, and the, the downside is that so if you use narrow slit widths, you get much, you get better resolution because it, it basically is going to determine what range of wavelengths are allowed through the monochromator. So if you use wider slit widths, you're going to be letting not as the light won't be as monochromatic. So if you want to have really monochromatic light, really good resolution, you need narrow slit widths, but it reduces the amount of light that gets in and out of the sample, so it reduces the amount of signal. Um, so it's, and then with wide slit widths. You often you can reduce the, the wavelength resolution, but you'll get better signals. So it's kind of a balancing act between these two factors. You want to find slit widths that give you good signal, and you know, but you don't want to use too wide a slit widths. But that that said, um, you know, most emission spectra that we re record are pretty broad, so you're not going to you know noticeably reduce your resolution with wide slit widths. It's just the slit widths that we use are not wide enough to really cause a problem, given how broad our spectra are. Um, but the most common values are between one and five nanometers. So if you have a really strongly emissive sample, you could go all the way down to one nanometer slit width. But if your sample is weak, you might need to go up as high as five or probably even beyond that in some cases if you need to. Um, so there's a lot more parameters too that we can select controlled by the instrument. So integration time is the amount of time the PMT averages signal at each wavelength. So again, the monochromator is gonna let one nanometer at a time into the into the PMT or one you know however however resolution you set it at, and how long the PMT collects and averages that signal is called integration time. 
So the default is, on our instrument, is 0.1 seconds per nanometer. So that means it's going to do one nanometer every 0.1 seconds. So if you, if you have a typical range of, you know, 400 nanometers, that's going to be like a 40 second collection. Um, and that works well for most of our samples, but if you have noisy samples, either because you're doing it at low temperature and there's a lot of you know bubbles or cracks in the sample, or if it's really weakly emitting, you can increase the integration time. Um, for stuff I did in grad school, I went as long as one second. I don't know if going beyond that is really worth your time. Because if you do one second integration in a 400 nanometer range, it's gonna take 400 seconds, whatever that is, like six, seven minutes just for one spectrum. So it slows down your collection a lot, obviously. Um, but it's worth it for high quality data, of course. Um, all right, then the number of averages, sometimes you can also set the instrument to collect the spectrum multiple times and average results. That's another way of sort of reducing random noise. So these two kind of work together if you have a lot of noise in your sample. Um, now, the other thing that's important to keep in mind, and this is why, um, so the instruments are all set up with this, these excitation and emission corrections. So these are typically done by the factory um, probably ideally we should have them updated at some point, but we never really, we never have. I mean, if you know, if you notice, I mean, we do a lot of standards in our instrument, like, you know, tetraphenylporphyrin and quantum sulfate. So, like, if you ever notice that the emission looks weird for some reason, um, sometimes it could just be monochromatic calibration, which is easy for us to fix, but if it starts to look really bizarre in terms of, you know, peak shapes or relative intensities, it might mean that we need to update these or check something else out. So, obviously, let me know if there's ever any problems, but... We haven't changed these yet, but there's excitation and emission corrections built into this into the software. So when we set up all of our different you know experimental parameters, all the experimental settings that we load in, those should always be included by def you know for any experiment you do. Um, and that's where you have the the way that our instrument labels it as you know S1 and S1C, right? So like S1 would be the uncorrected signal, S1C is corrected. And they're corrected for two things. So the excitation correction corrects for differences in excitation intensity. It actually does it in real time. So even if the lamp is fluctuating, it'll make that correction in real time. But also, as you change the excitation wavelength, you know that the, the um, you know that the, the they have different intensities as well. And so that corrects also for if you you know vary the excitation wavelength there'll be different intensities for the excitation. Um, emission correction corrects for differences in detector response. So the PMT does not respond the same at all wavelengths. So it's basically a device that converts a photon into an electrical signal, but the efficiency at which it does that is wavelength dependent. So the detector response corrects for that. Usually the, the PMTs are, are most sensitive in the middle range, like around 500 nanometers. But then as you go to longer or really shorter wavelengths, the, the PMTs aren't as sensitive, so you have to correct for that to get the correct peak shape and relative intensities. Um, so any, any questions so far about experiment parameters? All right, now what Morris mentioned again is the importance of excitation spectra in what we use them for, and, I, and they're gonna be um, primarily used to help us determine whether the emission that we're seeing is actually coming from the compound that we're measuring or from an impurity in solution. Because for a typical solution spectrum, dilute solution, pure compound, your excitation and your absorption should match each other. Um, and so that's, you know, true, especially if, you know, we also have, we talked about Kasha's rule last time, which says that no matter what wavelength you excite at, it should relax to the lowest energy state before emission. So if that's true also, which it is in 99.9% .9 of the cases, then you'll again see that match between absorption and emission. Now, the reason this works is because of that, we talked about the dependence before of the photoluminescence intensity on the absorbance of the sample. Now, technically, they're not linear related. So they have this, I don't even know what you call that, negative, who's good at math? What's a, what's a 10 to the minus A called? Negative exponent? Negative? Is it? I'm actually asking for help. I'm not trying to quiz you guys. <laughs> I really don't, I forget what it's called. I just, I'm bad with my mathematical term. I haven't taken a math class since many of you have been alive. So um, at least some of you have been alive, I wouldn't say all of you. Um, so anyway, whatever this functional dependence is called, that's as we talked about the relationship between observed intensity and absorbance. Um, so they're technically not linear related, but if you have an optically, optically dilute sample where the absorbance is less than 
then this relationship is pretty close to linear at, at that range of absorbance values. And so because you have a linear relationship between intensity and absorbance, if you change the excitation wavelength, where it absorbs more, it's going to emit more, and those would be linear related. And that means your absorption and your excitation should overlap pretty well if you have a diluted solution where, where that's true. So I think this is a video, but is it not loaded? So why is this video not showing up? Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, so even, you know, it's important to do this because even minor impurities can show up in photoluminescence because, you know, photoluminescence is not like absorbent. Absorp absorption is a, um, you know, it's a, it's measuring relative intensities. Remember, we talked about that before where it's your absorbance is related to the, you know, exit intensity over the incident uh, as a logarithm form, and it's linear related to concentration. So for an absorption measurement, if you have a 1% impurity, you probably won't see it because unless its extinction coefficient is super high, it's only going to absorb at 1% of whatever your actual sample does. But emission, as we know, is a, it's measuring absolute intensity. So it's even a 1% impurity, if it has a really high quantum yield, can show up because we can measure samples that have quantum yields below 1%. So if you have a 1% impurity that has a really high quantum yield, you'll see it if that's the only thing that's emitting in your sample. So you do have to be very careful with impurities. And one of the best ways to check that is by looking at whether your absorption and your excitation overlay. So here's just a, a simulation. The only reason this is even animated is because one of the reviewers in my book said, oh, you should animate that figure. And I thought it was dumb, but we did it anyway. Um, so, because again, the, the, the whole point in our life is to keep reviewers happy. That's what most of us spend our time doing. All right, so this is these are absorption spectra, and then we're going to see what happens when they do and do not match. So if you have a good match with a dilute sample, when you record the excitation, you should see it lie pretty much on top. There might be like slight deviations in intensity or band shape. It's not going to always be perfect. But then if you go to a sample where there's an impurity, if you see something like this, you should that should immediately raise a red flag. Because clearly in this case, the peaks of your excitation spectrum don't match your absorption. They're off by quite a bit in this case. Um, so, you know, if, if the profiles don't match, then you need to understand why that is. Sometimes there are benign explanations, but usually it means you have an impurity to worry about. So that's why we check that. Um, it's one of the main reasons we, we do have station spectra. And again, if they're dilute, you should see a pretty good match, and we've, we've seen that time and time again in our research. Okay. Now, another technique to talk about is that which we do have the capabilities to do to some extent is time resolved photoluminescence. Um, so in, in a lot of ways, the instrumentation and sample preparation, all that is very similar to steady state measurements. So the same types of samples you use for steady state are possible with, with time resolve. So whether you're talking about solutions, solids, films, as we talked about earlier, low temperature is challenging with, with our lifetime instrument, but it's not impossible. We have done it before, and if we got better sample holders, we could more easily do it. Um, usually they have very similar types of detectors. I think ours is still a PMT. It looks kind of like a camera, but I think it's still actually a PMT, but I'm actually not 100% sure about that. But it's the same type of detector. But there are some differences, of course, to allow you to get that time resolution that you need for this experiment. Because as, you know, the time resolution is very, very short for fluorescent samples you need to often go below nanoseconds for phosphorescent samples it's a, a wider range but even in many cases microseconds is common and considering that the was the blink of an eye is like what like three milliseconds or something like that so it's really fast time resolution I mean, as, as fast as you blink that signal has gone so um, it needs to be able to do that and so that, so it it needs to use a pulse light source and that can provide a really fast burst of excitation light to your sample to then be able to simultaneously excite a lot of molecules into the excited state. So there's a lot of different ways of doing this. Um, the best, if we if we had unlimited resources, would be lasers, because lasers are exceptionally powerful and they can have, the time resolution depends on what kind of laser it is, but they can be very good as well in that regard. Um, so a lot of like physical chemistry groups, when they do time resolve luminescence, they just do it on their laser table with sort of a custom built Thing. That's what Jimmy Bowes' group does when they do lifetime. So they'll have a laser source and then all the other optics they need to direct it into the, into the detector. So the most common lasers, you guys are all photochemists, so you should be at least a little bit familiar with this, even though we don't do lasers in our group. Most common are neodymium, YAG. Um, I forget what YAG stands for, but um, 
anyway, it's it's a these typically are these most often provide green like the green laser pointers that you have are often neodymium. Is it like yttrium, aluminum, gallium? Yeah. yeah. It's like yttrium, aluminum, gallium. No, garnet. Okay. Yeah, you got to know this if you're going to go to Phil's. Yeah. So. <laughs> Start studying. Um, all right. So, so the neodymium YAGs are um, one of their strongest harmonics anyway is 532. So, so and I think this is actually the type of laser that a lot of green laser pointers use that are commercially available for other applications. You can double that to 267, so if you need to excite in the UV, you can do that with neodymium YAG as well. There's, there's different ways of adjusting the wavelength on lasers, because they typically have a you know, fundamental wavelength that's their output, and then it's easy to double that. They have different optics that can double the frequency um, or, or have the wavelength as we show here. Um, you can also have, you can do more fine adjustments of the wavelength as well. There's different things called, I, I, OPO and OPA, like optical parametric. You need to learn this one too, Michael. Um, <laughs> OPO, OPA. I forget what they stand for. Optical parametric something or another. Um, but anyway, those allow you to actually adjust the wavelength over not necessarily a continuous range, but over some range of wavelengths. Um, but anytime you do that, you do lose intensity. So using one of these fundamentals is usually going to give you the most intense excitation source. Um, so like titanium sapphire would be 400. As a, as a strong harmonic at 400. I think it's actually 800 is the fundamental, but doubling that to 400 is, is very common. It gives you a nice, intense, you know, purple type of color for your laser. And then uh, Jim and Bao is a nitrogen laser, which puts out 337 nanometers, is, is a pretty intense source. I think that's what you guys used, or something like that. No, you guys use diodes, I think. Mm, yeah. But yeah, he, yeah. He, he has a nitrogen laser. We definitely use the diode at the liquid nitrogen. Yeah, so then um, those are different types of lasers. The advantages are they're very powerful, and the time resolution is good. The disadvantages are how much they cost. Um, and also, they're not the easiest things to maintain. Um, they, they require a lot of expertise and maintenance to keep them up and running and to troubleshoot them and all that stuff. So the one that we use are pulsed LEDs. So there's just, you know, they'll put out one wavelength. Usually it's a range, like a five nanometer range or so, but it's... Um, you select a different one depending on where you need to excite your sample. They're cheap and they're easy to use. Um, cheap is the part is the main reason why we have them. Um, but the disadvantage is that they're not very powerful, so they they don't put out nearly as much light as as a laser. So that's why, as you guys know, what's one of the reasons anyway why measuring lifetimes on very weak samples can be a challenge. And it's in part because our excitation source is not very powerful, so you don't get a lot of emission off those samples. Now, the other thing that you need in a time-resolved instrument is, I'm not going to go into the details of this, nor probably could I, but you need different electronic components that allow you to do what's called photon counting, basically to give you that time resolution of when the photons are, are being emitted. And the most common method is called time-correlated single photon counting, TCSPC, that's what, that's what we have. Um, so the way that this works is um, the sample is repeatedly excited with the pulse source, and then basically the electronic components act as a stopwatch. So after each excitation pulse, it measures how long does it take for that first photon to be emitted. Because if you excite a single molecule that has, you know, we know that it has a lifetime and, and the decay curve for the ensemble is going to look, you know, like a range of times. But for a single molecule, it's sort of a, I don't know if I'm using the right terminology, like a stochastic process, a, it's a probabilistic outcome. So at, there's going to be some probability of the photon coming out at, some, at, at, each time, at each time point. And so it measures how long it takes that first photon to be generated, and it basically makes a histogram. And that histogram ends up being the decay curve that you get. Um, so it's more or less a statistical method. So each detection for the TCSP is only one single photon, ideally. But it does that thousands and thousands of times so that you build up enough photons to generate a histogram of when that photon is actually coming out of the instrument. Um, so so that's, how you, that's how you do it. Um, and we'll talk a little bit later about one of the, then one of the things you have to be careful about with TCSP is not that, just make sure you don't have too many photons being detected at, at too rapid of a time scale. Because again, it works best when you're just detecting one photon at a time. If you get a bunch of photons coming off at the same time, then you're going to have what's called pile up, and that's going to distort the the signal at the at the early time points. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Now the trickiest part about 
time resolved photoluminescence is fitting the decay curve, as, as some of you guys probably know. You know, collecting the data is not too much more difficult or probably any more difficult than collecting the steady state in most cases. But once you have the data, you have to fit it correctly to get the lifetime and you have to make sure you're using the, the proper, you know, fitting equation, all that stuff. Um, so most often, if you have a single emitting sample, if it's pure compound, if it's in, especially if it's in solution, you should be able to fit to a single exponential decay. So as we talked about last time, the decay of the excited state is first order, and so it should fit to this nice first order decay, um, which is, this is the, the equation we gave last time, the integrated rate law. So the data here is plotted in two ways. So this would be on a linear scale. This is looking again how the intensity decays with time, or if you want to think about it as sort of a histogram, at each time point you measure different amounts of photons coming off of the sample, where it's more likely to come off versus where it's less likely. You get a histogram and you fit that to an exponential decay. So this is plotted in linear form. And over here, this is the exact same data. It's just plotted with a logarithmic axis on the y-axis, which is often how you see it. <clears throat> the reason for that is because when you plot it in a log form, you get a, you get a linear dependence. And especially, you know, back in the old days before Origin Lab and computers, it was a lot easier to fit a linear um, decay than it was to fit exponential. And you could use slide rules and things like that to find the log pretty easily. So, um, anyway, that, that's that's ancient history now. But we always do the fitting computerized, so it really doesn't matter how you plot the data; you'll get the same fit either way. So this is showing a good mono exponential fit. You'll see that the red curve, which is the the best fit curve, <clears throat> follows the data really well. Both in you know, if you look at it in the linear sense or in the logarithmic sense, that red line goes right through the data. And the other thing to look at is what's called the residuals. Um, so the residuals here are, it's a statistical measurement of how much the fitted curve deviates from the actual data that you're fitting. And it should be pretty random and pretty flat. Um, so if you see a residual that looks like that, that's evidence that you have a good fit. And then the other parameter that we use, which our um, instrument spits out if we're fitting it there, is called chi-squared, which um, I'll talk about a little, a little bit that later. Um, so this uh, decay does require an X off. So if you're trying to fit the data in origin, like not using the, the software, it requires an X offset be, in, many, in most cases because depending on what instrument parameters you use, the decay will not necessarily start right at T equals zero. So you either need to shift the, the thing to so where it starts at T equals zero or you just fit the curve with an X offset to account for that. Um, and so, so there's some you know, fit in origin, you have to do a little bit differently, but it's still the same, same idea. So this is an example of a really good mono exponential fit. Now let's say we got some data that looks like this. In this one, we I try to fit it mono exponential. This is actually simulated data. This isn't real data, but um, it looks similar. And so I, so if you try to fit this with a mono exponential, we'll see something. We'll see some problems that show up here. So first, if you look at it closely, you can see that the fit is not great. I don't know how well it's showing up on the screen, but on the projection screen, but like you can see that this red curve does not quite follow, especially at the early time points. And if you look at the linear part, it looks like the red curve kind of, you know, the, the, the raw data sort of dips below the red line here and it doesn't really follow as perfectly as last time. So that's one thing sometimes you can just tell by looking at it, but obviously that's not the best way. The other thing, as I said, is the chi-squared value. Um, so if your chi-squared is exceptionally small, which is not a problem that I think we'll ever have to deal with because we collect so much time points on our instrument. But if your sky squared is really small below 0.8, that usually means you don't have enough data. But what you're more likely to see if you have a poor fit is that your chi squared is, is large. And there's there's no set cutoff for this, but I would say if it's above 1.2, you should be suspicious that your fit might need to be adjusted a little bit. Um, and the other thing is, you know, the, the re, where the residuals are helpful is if you see this sort of thing here where there's, they sort of have a periodic structure to them where sort of goes up and then down and sort of oscillates, especially at early time points, that's again usually a sign that your fit is not very great. Um, so the most common solution when you have a poor fit using a single exponential decay is to just go to a bi-exponential. So more generally, multi-exponential fits look like this. So it's a sum of multiple terms with multiple time constants associated with each term and different um, weighting factors alpha out front. Bi-exponential would be n equals two, so you would just have 
you know, two terms added together for your bias one, which will fit with two different time constants. Um, and so this is the same data as the last one, now fit to a bias exponential, and you can see that the fit lines up much better visually. And in the linear form, the where we're doing a logarithmic plot, you can see that there's that little bit of a bend in the red line if you're looking closely, and that's now reproduced well in the fit as also. So it doesn't really look a lot different, but it does change the fitting parameters quite a bit. And now you can see, especially with the residuals, um, that it's a nice flat random residual. Now these were fit in origin and I for the life of me cannot figure out how to get chi-squared values in origin that it gives you a chi-square but it like has it's like a totally different scale than the chi-square that we get from our instrument so it's probably just me not knowing enough about statistics to be able to figure out how to do that so I don't know what the chi-squared values are in these fits but this one looks like it would definitely be a chi-square that's well below that cutoff of 1.2. The previous one, I'm sure, would have been pretty high. I, don't, I can't tell you the exact high squared values for these, say, your fit and origin. Now, when you get a bi-exponential fit, the way that you would typically report the lifetime is as an average. And so this is the, there's different ways of averaging the lifetime, and some people, a lot of people do it wrong, I would say. But this is the best if you're just, if you just have a single sample that's, um, Emitting. There's also the linear average, which would just be this bottom part here. Um, but that I think that's appropriate in some situations, but in general, this is the best one if you just have a single, what you think is a single compound emitting and you just want to report the average lifetime. Um, so you can see in this fit the residuals are improved. Now you should always though be suspicious of why you have a bi exponential decay if you do. Um, I mean, we've had you know, bias exponential decays in solution that didn't seem to indicate a huge problem with the sample. You know, we still had everything else checking out. But if it's a solution sample and you think it's a, you know, single pure compound and you're getting bias exponential decays, you should be a little bit cautious and make sure that you're not missing something about the, you know, the purity of your compound or about, some, you know, the emission not being what you're expecting it to be or, you know, multiple emitting species. When you're doing samples that are solids or films, you almost always get Poly exponential decays, that's just the way it goes because there's usually heterogeneity in those types of samples. Um, but for solution samples, they, they should usually be mono exponential. Does that work for, I guess, for, for the first like, uh, like publication? I like that one sample that had uh, a bi exponential decay. And the decay was like probably about the photo dissociation. So, like, how does that, I guess, really Well, that was a bi exponential decay in. Um, in transient absorption, right? So that's a little bit different in that case. I guess if there was, I don't know if you would see the, because the thing is here you're only detecting emission, so if there was photochemistry happening and the product was luminescent, then you might see it as a bi exponential decay because then you're basically producing a, another. But you have to, in the time scale of the experiment, or, or you have to produce enough of that to actually detect the emission from this. So it's, but in a, in, a, in a transient absorption experiment, you're measuring species that are produced immediately after the laser pulse hits them. So if, if you get dissociation um, caused by your laser pulse and you produce something new and that new thing has a little bit different of, of an absorption spectrum, then you will see it immediately even if it's not there in high concentration. Because basically in a transient absorption, you're just measuring whatever's in the laser beam. In this, it's more of a bulk measurement and you're only detecting whatever emits in your solution. So if you had decomposition over long time scales and whatever you decompose to was luminescent, you might see that, but it would not necessarily be there immediately. Um, but yeah, you should always think about why you have a bias exponential decay and make sure that you're not missing something. Now the other type of time resolve experiment you can do, which I actually in some cases, I really wish we could, but we just don't have the instrumentation that allows us to do this, is an actual time resolved emission spectrum. So this requires you that you have the time resolution and the wavelength resolution. So our instrument that we use for lifetimes only can resolve time but not wavelength. So um, you know, for our instrument, if you want to change the wavelength, all you can do is put filters in, but you can't really select a single wavelength at a time. But if you have an instrument that has a monochromator paired up with your TCSPC, then you can do time resolved emission spectra. And actually we thought about adding this to our instrument, but then it was during the pandemic and the sales reps for Haribo were just impossible to deal with, so we gave up because Jaco wanted it for something. But anyway, what time resolved emission does is if you have, um, it's, it's useful for situations where you have two emitting 
states or multi-exponential decays. Because it, it shows you how the emission profile changes over time. So like in this sample here, if you just look at the spectrum, the red one would be what you see at the initial time point. You know, you could say, well, is that two overlapping emission bands or is that just some weird vibronic structure going on? I don't really know. But then you would notice that this would probably have a bias exponential decay, especially if you were detecting at all wavelengths like we do. But if you do the time resolved emission spectra, what you can see is that this band decays much faster. So at longer time points, this band is gone and you're just left with the second band there. So that tells you that you have two different emission bands, two different emitting species in the solution, not that it's some vibronic structure. Because if it's vibronic structure, the two vibronic bands should decay at the same time scale. And they would all just, but in this case, this one's decaying faster, this one's slower. So that would tell you that you have two things going on. So time resolved emission is useful for things like that, but we just can't do it. All right, what I'll get into next, which we've covered at previous group meetings, but I'll go through it a little bit again for the new people, is how to measure quantum yields. Um, so one common way to do that is with an integrating sphere. So that's what, this is what an integrating sphere looks like. Uh, this is not the exact one we have, but basically the sample sits inside of there. You completely close it up, and so it's a totally reflective surface on the inside of that sphere. So all the light that goes into the sample is collected, all the light that comes out of the sample is collected. So when you do an absolute quantum yield, you can do it in any, any type of sample. For, for films and solids, you pretty much have to do it this way. For solutions, we have two methods, and I'll cover the other one as well. Um, but, but you're basically ma making four measurements on the sample. So you're making, well, actually, two measurements on a blank, two measurements on the sample. So you're measuring excitation and emission for both. Um, and what you're doing in this case is when you measure the excitation spectra, you're actually monitoring at the excitation wavelength that you're using. So what you want to figure out is how much of the excitation light is absorbed by your sample. How much does that reduce as it passes through the sample? So you measure a blank excitation, that's this black curve here. So, and then when you have your sample in there, your sample is going to absorb some of the excitation, so that's why the intensity drops. And the difference the relative difference in the integration of these two peaks will tell you what percentage of your light is absorbed. And so that's going to be the denominator here, which is basically related to how many photons are absorbed. Because if you recall, I don't have the definition here, but photoluminescence quantum yield is number of, of emitted photons over number of absorbed photons. So the excitation spectra in a relative sense give you how many photons you're absorbing. And then you do the same thing for the emission. You measure the emission of the blank, which ideally should be pretty flat, but there's not a lot of background. And then you measure the sample emission, which is shown here in blue. So again, the integrated areas of those two subtract from each other is proportional to how many photons are emitted. So this is emitted photons, this is absorbed photons, and then you calculate your quantum yield in that way. Um, now this is all done by the computer, so you don't usually have to do this manually, but this is basically the math that the computer is doing. It integrates all these, all these things and combines them in this way. So your emission spectrum is going to be measured the same way, but your excitation in this case is monitored at the excitation wavelength to figure out how much excitation light is absorbed by your sample. And then the data is combined, again, by the computer in our case. The other common way to do it is, is, is using a relative method where you have a standard with a known quantum yield that you're going to compare yours to. This is most commonly done on solution samples, and it doesn't require an integrating sphere, so it's a more accessible way of doing it. So you have to select an appropriate standard, and there are lots of them out there. Um, the one that we often use in our group, especially for the emission in the blue region, is quinine sulfate. Another common one, which we don't use as often, but, um, is, is, but is still useful, is rhodamine B. This one, I think, emits in like the yellow region of the spectrum, so it's kind of the middle part of the visible spectrum, and it has a pretty high quantum yield. And the other one that we often use is tetraphenylporphyrin. Um, I think I forgot to put it in here. One thing, if you're ever deciding like what sample to use and you're thinking maybe I need a different one for some reason or want to try something different, uh, you should, and I think it's referenced in the actual book too, but um, this is a pretty useful website that you can sort through different compounds and it has, it's not a huge database, but it's a, a reasonably sized database of absorption and emission spectra for all kinds of different you know, photoactive molecules, mostly organic molecules, but um, it can be useful for identifying a standard to use for these types of measurements. The samples must be optically dilute because these measurements, again, rest on the assumption that 
absorption and emission are linearly related, which is only true at really low values of absorption, as we talked about earlier when we were discussing excitation spectra. So what you'll do is for the standard and for the sample, you'll measure absorption spectra and emission spectra. At minimum, you just need one of each, but we usually do it over a range of, of concentrations. And what you'll see here is these are all optically dilute, so the absorption values never go above 0.1, which is ideal. And then you measure the emission spectra every time you change the concentration. So this is tetraphenylporphyrin that I'm showing here, as, as many of you will recognize. So that's what you do for the standard, and then you'll do the same thing for your sample. So th this is an iridium compound. I think this is BT acnac probably. Um, and so you'll measure absorption of a range of concentrations, again, making sure, I think we excited this one at 420, so we didn't go above 0.1 at that wavelength, um, and barely above 0.1 anywhere, and then you measure emission at the same wavelength. And then what you do is you plot both of those. So you integrate the emission spectra, and you plot that relative to absorption at the excitation wavelength. So then you get a slope for each of those. So this red one here is our sample, this is, again, the slopes, um, this is integrated emission plotted versus absorption at the excitation wavelength. Both these were excited at 420. And so you get a slope for that line, which is your sample, and that's labeled as X here. You get a slope for the reference, which is labeled as REF, and then you put it into this equation. So phi REF is the quantum yield of the standard, tetraphenylporphyrin is 0.11. Those are the two slopes that you get. And then if you use different, if you use two different solvents for the standard and the reference, you have to also correct for the index of refraction of the solvent, which can affect things as well. So that's what those numbers are. Those are just numbers you would look up in the, using the Google machine or common chemistry references. Um, and so, so that gives you the quantum yield. So that's how you do it in relative sense. I covered that in more detail in a, in a previous group meeting, so you can ask me about that if, if I don't want to spend too much time on that. Now one thing I didn't talk about here is selection of the standard. So there's a lot of options. Since our instrument is you know, excitation and emission corrected, it's not super important, but it still is helpful to pick one that emits in a similar region of the spectrum, since the detection is, you know, that way you don't have to worry about errors in, in detection. If your you know, standard emits in the deep blue and your sample emits in the near infrared, you might get different detection efficiencies there. So it's better to have them in similar regions of the spectrum. and you know, the quantum yields can't be too different because you have to keep the instrument settings identical for the standard and the sample. So if you're, you know, if one of them has a ton of signal and one of them barely has any, it might be hard to, to do that if, if, you know, without changing the instrument settings. So, you know, that can be a factor as well. So these are three common ones, um, but there are many others that are available. It's also best typically to use fluorescent standards rel rel uh, as opposed to phosphorescent because phosphorescent quantum yields are dependent on oxygen. So you don't want to have that sort of factor into your measurement either. Um, and the ones that are in this database, you should be able to trust the quantum yields. They're pretty long established, well established standards that everybody's used for, for years and years. So, because um, what a lot of people do, which is a, a practice that I advise against, is they'll use either one of their own compounds or a very similar literature compound as their standard. But then there's like a 50% chance that that quantum yield is wrong. And so if the quantum yield of your standard is wrong, then the quantum yield that you measure for your sample is definitely going to be wrong. And we actually talked about that at our last group meeting where people were using tresphenyl purity and iridium as a standard for a long time, and the quantum yield of that was reported incorrectly for a few decades. So um, now the literature is filled with all kinds of problems because of that. So it's better to use one of those really well-established organic fluorescent st standards if, if you can. All right, so that takes care of that. Another type of experiment that's important for a lot of things is variable temperature photoluminescence. So, you know, why would you do this? Um, the first is that, as we've experienced in some of our projects, some compounds don't luminesce at room temperature, or they might be fluorescent at room temperature and phosphorescent at low temperature, and so you can see both of them by changing the temperature. Um, sometimes cooling the sample can give you insight into the nature of the emissive state. We talked a little bit about TADF last time, so variable temperature is important for that. Um, and also for, you know, whether it's a, you know, Ligand Center and MLCT set, all those details that we discussed in our group, which I won't go through today for this. Now, the other thing you can do is if you go to exceptionally low temperature, which, again, this is an experiment that I dream about, but we can't actually do in our lab, um, you can resolve sublevels for states that have higher multiplicity. So, you know, doublet, triplet, quartet, whatever. 
if you go to really low temperature, you can resolve the sublevels. That can give you insight into the spin orbit coupling and things like that. Now, the important thing is you know, how you do the experiment. So you, you have to control the temperature. The best way is with a cryostat. They look something like this. Um, I think Jacoa Bergach's group has one, and I don't know what temperature ranges are available. They do a lot of high temperature measurements on theirs, I think, but I think they, they can at least go down to liquid nitrogen temperatures. The really fancy ones can go down to liquid helium temperatures. But they are, they are costly and they're pretty finicky to use. They have, they have all kinds of problems with seals leaking and all that stuff. They just, they're kind of nightmarish. So um, if you, you know, if you want to spend like your, a whole day doing one spectrum, then use a cryostat. If you want to do it, there's, but if you want to do it faster, there's better ways, if you just, especially if you just need a single temperature. The nice thing about them, though, is that you can control the temperature in, in increments. So if you really want to do a true variable temperature measurement, this is the best way to do it, because your temperature can be controlled. So the way these work is you would, they have a, you have a coolant flowing through, so either liquid nitrogen or if you need to go really low liquid helium, which is getting harder and harder to get. Then they have a heating element that kind of counteracts it. It kind of works the same way as the cold stream on the X-ray diffractometers. So the heating element basically opposes the cold stream, and, and they kind of it runs the heating element to get whatever temperature you're, you're desiring. So you, the lowest you can go is whatever cryogen you're using, and then you can go anything higher than that as well. So the better, the faster way to do it, the low tech, cheap way to do it is with a doer like we do. Um, but you can really only do low temperatures that you can't heat the sample in a doer, obviously and you have limited temperatures accessible. So we pretty much only do liquid nitrogen temperature, which is 70, 70 Kelvin. But in principle, there's other, you know, cooling baths available, you know, dry ice acetone, um, liquid nitrogen isopropanol, you know, you can, you can, in principle, access different temperatures. And if you have a, a low temperature thermometer, you can measure that. So you could do a crude variable temperature measurement in a doer, but you just wouldn't be able to do as many temperatures or wouldn't be able to easy to control it. Um, so that's how we would typically do it. All right, but I don't want to talk anything about that. The last thing that I want to end with, I think this is the last thing I have, are you know common mistakes, common pitfalls of fluid luminescence measurements. Because um, when you, I mean, we've seen, we've talked about some of these at group meeting. They've come up from time to time, but you know most of you guys are pretty good about avoiding these. But if you've, you know, if you've reviewed as many papers as, as I have, which at this point is like probably 50 a year, I do too many, but um, you see these mistakes like over and over again, so I want to make sure we're aware of them. All right, we already talked about this one a little bit, but a lot of people overinterpret emission intensity. They'll just measure two samples and say, oh, this one has higher emission intensity than that one. But again, there's so many factors that control that, and especially they'll, they'll compare two samples that have wildly different absorbance values, then you definitely can't make the comparison even, even if everything else was controlled. So. Again, there's so many factors you have to control that really if you want to say that this compound is more strongly emissive than that compound, the, the only true way to do that is by measuring the photoluminescence quantum yield, which really isn't that hard to do, so I don't know why people just don't do that more often. But um, The other thing we've talked about is be careful with you know sample impurities or background emission. Um, I don't think any of the filters that we use have this problem, but even as we talked about, even small 1% impurities, you know, we, we've had... I think we've discussed this exact case at a group meeting before. Um, the, the fluoridated knack knack compounds with iridium that we first made, that um, so an undergrad, Rosa, was leading that project. And they had like pretty good NMRs, they passed elemental analysis, and we still saw extra emission bands that we finally figured out was a tiny impurity. So, and those only emitted at low temperature and they were pretty weak, so that's where those problems are especially prevalent, right? So you have to be really careful with that, especially for weekly emitting samples, even if the impurities don't easily show up on NMR or even elemental analysis. And again, as I've ranted about before at group meetings, that's why I don't think elemental analysis is like the best technique to use for luminescent compounds. You can have perfect elemental analysis, but that doesn't mean you're not going to have some problem. So you, have to, you have to know how to look for it, basically. Um, all right, and then it can also be introduced via you know, the solvent, um, you know, whatever support matrix if you're doing a film sample or even the filters can be luminescent. I, I think the type of filter we have are designed not to be luminescent. I don't think we ever had a problem with that, but um, if you're unsure, if you see something suspicious in your sample you don't expect, you could always check that by just running a blank. Um, the solvent shouldn't have any problems, the types that we use, but 
if you're using solvents in the glove box especially and sharing them with you know up to a dozen other other you know dozen other people who may or may not be as careful as you are you just worry about them getting contaminated from time to time so again look out for that be careful and then if you're ever worried just bring in your own solvent to use for your emission measurement don't share it with anybody else just bring a small amount in that you need for that for that experiment so again when in doubt you can check blank samples if you want to find out is that emission coming from the solvent or something else as opposed to your sample the other thing that you sometimes see is um, I, I think our instrument is pretty good at eliminating this but um, you can sometimes in you know samples that don't emit you'll see some scattered lamp light that goes through um, and it usually has like a broad and pretty odd peak shape so it'll look something like this um, so it's usually like centered around 400 nanometers and it'll be kind of like it'll be kind of noisy and kind of like a really weird shape like that um, so if you if you see it and you've you know especially if you're experienced with emission you'll know that it doesn't look like a real emission spectrum but some people still interpret it as such um, I think our instrument, I don't know, if, I don't think we've ever seen that before, but I could be wrong. Um, but some other older instruments, you, you get that, where if, you, if your sample's not emitting, just a little bit of the lamp light bleeds through into the monochrometer, um, and then it shows up in your emission. Uh, it's usually has a really broad shape, because it's basically the continuous white light, and it's kind of odd peak shape, it's not really the normal peak shape that we would see. We talked about this as well a little bit with you know, selecting the correct wavelength range or second order harmonics, um, so we don't need to belabor that point anymore. In, in phosphorescent samples, you have to be careful with oxygen contamination. It won't really change the appearance of the spectrum. If you're trying to get an accurate quantum yield in a lifetime, you need to make sure that your sample is, is air free. Now, there's a, a few different effects that are described as inner filter effect. It can kind of refer to a couple different situations. So, one is that if you have too high of a concentration, your excitation beam can be strongly attenuated as it travels through the sample. Um, in the extreme limit, you would basically only excite the very front of the sample and then the emitted light wouldn't even really come out where it needs to come out. So if, you're, if it's too sample, you're basically not exciting the whole sample. And that, that can be a little bit, I mean, you wouldn't do a quantum yield in that high of a sample anyway, but it could be a problem for quantum yields as well, because, um, but you just want, you typically want to avoid having that. Now the other secondary effect is in compounds that have a, a small stoke shift, so fluorescent compounds like bodippies, for example, where the absorption and the, over, and the emission overlap, if your sample is concentrated, some of the emitted light is going to be then reabsorbed by the sample. Um, and so when that happens, it can change the shape of the, of the, um, of the peak, especially in the side where, the, where, the, where it overlaps with the absorption. So, it's especially important for fluorescent samples not to use too high of a concentration if you want the spectrum to look correct and especially the quantity to be accurate. So those are things you, could, you need to be aware about with, with sample concentrations. Um, for phosphorescent samples, you can usually get away with high concentrations because there's very little, if any, overlap between the absorption and the emission. But um, you still have to be careful that you're not jacking the concentration too high or else your excitation beam won't even travel through the sample very far. Um, in lifetime measurements, time resolved measurements, you have to be aware of excessive count rates. Um, so you want to shoot for basically one detected photon for every 20 to 100 excitation pulses. That es essentially assures that in most of the shots, you're getting just a single photon detected. As we said, that's ideally what should happen. So, you know, there's that count rate on the instrument that you try to sort of optimize before you start collecting that I think. Yeah, so it recommends 2%, I think. Um, I mean, basically the suggestion is up to 5% is probably fine. So if it's 1 out of 20 or so, you get a pretty accurate readout. So that's telling you basically how many out of, you know, what percentage of the excitation pulses are resulting in the detected photon. And if it's too high, then you have a high likelihood of getting multiple detected photons, and you get what's called pile-up, where you get more photons detected at early time points so honestly, if you if you have a what looks to be a bi-exponential decay, if your if your uh, count rate is too high, that could be a reason for it. So try reducing that and seeing if the fit becomes more single exponential, because it basically results in more photons being detected early. So it looks like you have basically a fast component that decays early, 
and then a longer component, but in reality, it's just distorted by, by, what, by that pile-up effect. So that's the importance of that number, if, if it wasn't obvious why we have to do that. Um, all right, more things that can happen. This one I, I gave its own slide because I want to show you sort of what it looks like. So you have to be a little bit careful about saturating the detector. So the, the PMT that we have and that most instruments have it only has a linear response over a limited range of intensity. So at some point, the, the response becomes nonlinear, and that's going to distort your sample. Or if you get to the extreme where you've completely saturated, it basically just causes the sample, this signal to flatline, even even if it's not supposed to be. So every instrument is different. Um, I think on our on our Flora One, it's rated as being linear up to I believe it's two million raw counts. So that'd be the S One. So so this is not the correct signal with the raw signal. In reality, I think we've gone a few times higher than that and it doesn't seem to be a problem. But if you get up to like 10 million or so, you should probably be suspicious. I mean, those of you that have experience with it can probably give a better estimate than I can. But um, now what it looks like in that extreme, and in the solution to this is just to reduce, to reduce the slit width and see if the profile looks different. If you reduce your slit width and your emission spectrum looks different in terms of the shape or the relative intensities of you know different peaks, that probably means they were too high to begin with, and that was being distorted by this nonlinear response. So in an extreme, what it looked like is something like this. So if your emission spectrum has a tabletop on it, then that probably means this is simulated data, so it's the best I could do with an origin simulation. But um, if you see an emission spectrum that looks like that, that is a sign that you're saturating your detector. And again, over this middle range here, you're probably, you know, you're saturated, and the rest of it would probably be a little bit off too. So what you would want to do again is reduce the slit width and see if that returns the more normal Gaussian shape to your, your peak. And if that's the case, that just means your slit width is too high at first. Um, so I don't know, do you know if it's the same range on our Fluoro 2? Does anybody know that? Same, same, the same raw counts? Okay, yeah. so yeah, both instruments are, are designed the same, it sounds like, where if you want to be sure that you're linear, your raw counts should be 2 million or less. I think it's a little bit more forgiving, so if you go outside of that range, especially if you're not doing something you know, super quantitative, it should be fine, but um, if you get too high, you'll start to see stuff like this. And that's, of course, the sign this thing as well. I think that's the last thing, yep. So any, any last questions before we wrap this up? All right, so we're, I think we're about halfway done. What are there, six chapters, and that's chapter three? So we're um, about halfway done. I. The next chapter, I believe, deals with quenching, so biomolecular processes that can, in most cases, actually reduce your photoluminescence, but how we measure those and, and sort of the kinetics of those. So that'll be relevant to the photoredox people in the, in the lab. That one I don't think is a particularly long chapter either, so that, that workshop will probably be a little bit shorter than this one. Um, so that's all I had to cover for today, so uh, I think there's a little bit of a break now from this, so I'll be back in a few weeks for the next one. So unfortunately, at least two people won't be in the group anymore. A nice workshop. So I hope you enjoyed your last workshop. <laughs>